Hello, and welcome to Take the Stand, Inclusive Leaders. I'm Dana Dennis-Smith. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Obelisk Support, a legal services business, and the founder of the first 100 Years Project, which celebrates the achievements of women in law. I'm on a mission to make the legal sector a more inclusive place, and so I've invited legal industry leaders who also care about inclusivity to have a conversation with me. This episode, I'm talking to Sam Lester, who heads up legal for EMEA and Asia at TD Securities, an investment bank. Sam, welcome to our program. Hi, Donna. Thanks for having me. To start us off, I wanted to ask you uh, a question about what does inclusive leadership mean to you? I think the best way to, to think about it is that it's changing every day, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think it's about um, a few different things. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I sort of bucket them into different categories, but then at the same time, I think one always tends to be influencing the other. They sort of satellite around my day to day. Um, so I guess, yeah, in no particular order. Um, I think uh, uh, being inclusive, um, I, think it, I think it's about commitment in the first, in the first instance, um, you know, uh, making sort of that visible um, authentic commitment to, to being inclusive as a leader and um, holding yourself accountable, holding, holding others accountable to that standard and sort of making it your, your sort of personal sort of priority to do that. Um, I, think, I think commitment can go a long way. Um, um, in terms of making things happen and consistency. Um, what else can I think about in terms of inclusiveness? Um, I think it's probably a, a, a good dose of humility in terms of in terms of what makes what makes me um, inclusive. Um, I think uh, sort of taking a sobering look at myself and my capabilities, knowing what I'm good at, knowing what I'm not great at, and knowing that actually there's as far as I can see just a fantastic opportunity to um, collaborate with others and, and help fill in that bench so that you know um, you know uh, acknowledging that I can't do it on my own I think is, is, is actually really gratifying for me as a leader and um, admitting mistakes you know um, I think I think is a great part of being inclusive something which I think has taken me um, taken me a long time to actually get my head around and um, for, for a, a large part of my career and again I think it could be a, a lot about sort of my background, sort of the leaders that I learned from in, in you know, when I was coming up through the ranks, for better or worse, you know, the, this idea of admitting a mistake that was sort of tantamount to sort of, you know, um, uh, career suicide is just, you know, um, we, we, particularly as lawyers, you know, we had to just be these infallible, knowing oracles. Um, and actually, um, I found from working with some amazing leaders, both at TD and at other institutions, there's nothing that makes me, that really brings me in and makes me feel like it's okay. Then when someone that's in a really senior position, like, just turn around to me and go, oh, no, I messed that up, or, oh, I don't know that one, or we should find, find that out. I think that really, for me, as a self-deprecating Englishman, like, that really brings that brings brings me into the room, and I really try and give that back as well. I think I want to create spaces where people feel like it's completely okay and it's important to make mistakes. I think one thing that, again, every day just becomes more of a revelation for me is just I'm just being aware of the biases that I'm bringing to a conversation. I think is so key to inclusivity. You know, I, I was thinking about this this morning that um, I always used to have a very rogue. Um, sort of robotic answer when when someone would talk to me about bias, which was that you know, well, I'm one of these really peculiar people, as uh, sort of born and raised in London. Um, as long as I can remember, I can I can remember getting on the tube and um, going into the city, and I always felt that London was such a culturally um, sort of mixed place that that this idea of a bias was just uh, almost impossible for me as a London. Like, how can I be biased? I've lived, lived and grown up in London. And I realised it was really sobering that, you know, particularly in the last five to ten years, as he and I have really sort of come onto the agenda um, and influences so much of my day to day that I just really couldn't say that with, um, with, with complete honesty. Um, so, again, it's just sort of being aware of your biases, recognising your privilege um, and your blind spots, um, and, just, um, and just, yeah, um, sort of. Um, not relying on those assumptions, I think are all part of really, really important inclusive leadership. 
That's great, to be honest, because in a way you're saying by living in London, you see diversity, but we know diversity is not inclusion and they are separate. This is why, in a way, in my conversations, I focus on inclusive leadership as opposed to diverse and diversity, because I think um, that's what makes a workplace become a better one, you know. So um, it's really interesting what you say about observing the difference, but incorporating the difference, it, it's quite a different thing. Almost. I mean, there's stages to it. You know, I can say that um, not too long ago, um, I would have thought that I saw diversity, but I don't think I really did um, or recognised it or a lack of diversity as an issue. Um, I was just, I think I was just walking around sort of in a daze. And then again, when you have that penny drop moment, and once, I think as a, frankly, as a, uh, a uh, heterosexual white middle class person, um, it is an absolute revelation once so you tap into that sort of, you know, and you, and you start to see it everywhere the lack of representation. But again, uh, to your point, seeing that um, is completely separate from, okay, so how do I bring people in? How do I include people? How do I make people um, bring their complete selves or, you know, Make is completely the wrong word. How do I how do I encourage and foster that environment where people feel comfortable to bring, bring their opinions and ideas and backgrounds to work? Um, so yeah, I completely agree. Two separate things. I will ask you next. How do you? Can you give me an example of your leadership in practice and how you display some of the qualities you mentioned before? Because I was going to ask you next. You know, what are the top qualities? But you kind of mentioned them. You know, around humility and kind of being open. Um, so it would be great to see an example and hear an example from you about leadership, um, your leadership in practice. Yeah, I think it's about, um, and again, I'm, I'm very lucky, I think, at TV because a lot of the tools that allow me to, to lead in that way um, aren't just my mission statement, but it's the TV's mission statement. And what I really like about inclusive leadership, particularly where I work, is that it sort of deconstructs that myth that I would have thought a couple of years ago that inclusive leadership should be a completely sort of top-down approach and that we should all you know be waiting for you know our managers um, to um, you know or the c-suite of executives to display this sort of these initiatives and actually what's really cool about inclusive leadership I, I think is that it, I don't think inclusive leadership. and I make sure or continually strive to make sure that I have leaders at, in my team um, below me, next to me, above me, in every which way, um, because it's, it's less about reporting titles and, and managing structures and more about just, just people that want to bring their best selves to work to make to do the best possible job. I think that in order to do that, certainly, you need to foster, and again, I think part of the challenge is, is seeing some of the negative experience that I and my peers have had in past generations, and as the learning has come on, we've started to try and try and forge these more positive behaviours. But I think it's about a lot of it for me personally um, is about um, really creating um, psychological safety, um, emotional and emotional intelligence. I think you know I've I've had really good managers in the past. I've worked with really good people in the past. I've also worked with people that had a lot of work to do. I think a lot of it can really come down to emotional intelligence. I really hope that my team knows the people that are important to me know that, um, you know, my view is not the only view. Um, I um, welcome other views, um, other perspectives, and that's not for lip service. That's not so that we can mimic that everyone has their chance to speak. Um, it's because diverse ideas, diverse experiences enable growth. Um, they they enable innovation. They you know um, they enable us to differentiate. And in financial services, in you know in terms of what we do, you know the market is never been more competitive. Um, and and how do we grow? We differentiate ourselves. And so it's about um, you know sometimes it's about you know someone said to me a long time ago, and I think it was such a smart piece of advice. They always wanted to make sure that they were you know on a long email chain with 
50 people on it, they they always had to make sure that they were the last person to speak because, you know, um, sometimes in these conversations, once the perceived boss or decision maker has made their view, it's like, no one's really going to come after that view because it's like, well, I'm not going to disagree with that. That's clearly the right view and that's the experience of view. And in fact, it's that sort of fortuitous sort of figure of eight where you want people to be able to say what they feel is the right idea, even if it's the wrong idea, um, or, or not an idea that someone else is going to agree with. And also the leader allowing that breathing room. You know, um, so much I think I'm learning nowadays is, you know, so much of leadership is about just getting out of the way. Just get out of the way and let other people, um, you know, shine. And, 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 you know, you can still be, you know, you can be an amazing leader by backing other people. Like, you know, trying to detach the ego from these situations. You know, I have to be the loudest in the room. I have to be the first to speak, you know. Um, which I think a lot of it, frankly, in terms of, you know, the male psyche comes from a huge piece of insecurity. Um, you know, so um, I, I think it's about that. I think also in terms of collaboration, um, you know, curiosity, um, I think it's about taking those conscious moments outside of our BAE to sort of die, not die rise, because like, you don't really want those, you don't want, like, I, I want the sort of, um, exchange of ideas i think everyone wants it to be as natural as possible and as fluid as possible sometimes and i think it's sort of the COVID effect but i think sometimes you have everything now is in these allotted 30 minute slots and it just doesn't always foster sort of that organic sort of discussion and growth so so but on the other hand i feel like you have to start the conversation somewhere and you have to start doing it somewhere so i also like you know um that in our team um you know we will have monthly, weekly catch-ups, bi-weekly, where there's not always a set agenda. And it's just a space outside of the slightly more commoditized transactional work that we do, where people can just bring broader ideas and, um, you know, commentary, frustrations, you know, uh, uh, sort of a walk-in clinic. And, and I think, again, it's just creating those spaces where people feel comfortable. I think is is super important. I've found in the past, and again, I don't think it's anyone's fault. I just think it's symptomatic of where we've been in terms of thinking, in terms of society. I have found in the past where I haven't felt I could bring myself to work. Um, I didn't feel that inclusive environment. I always felt like I was operating a bit with one high, one hand high behind my back, and, and I don't think that's good for. for for uh, your your employer, I, I don't. I certainly don't think it's good for you or your mental health. I'm glad you mentioned your past because I was going to ask you next. You know, um, to give us an example of a a kind of experience of inclusive leadership you suffered. It doesn't need to be positive, but it would be nice if it was positive from your career journey and uh, that you felt it really impacted you and um, and why did it matter so much speaking from a place of real acknowledgement of privilege, because what I just think is, you know, a non-typical journey into law, for instance, for others, like, it's like, you know, it's been, it's been pretty okay for you. Before law, I certainly didn't think that law was going to be sort of, you know, where I where I made my career. I can't say I, I, I gave it a go in terms of the first career, because I wasn't really doing it that long, but for instance, um, straight out of university, and um, I had and still continue to have a real passion for theatre and film and cinema and I I thought I wanted to be a jobbing actor. Um, and for one reason or not, uh, another, um, mostly in terms of the sort of psychological sort of profile of that role, I just realised it wasn't for me. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't enjoying it. And I remember, you know, fast forward to when I started um, training as a solicitor, when I uh, took my first in-house role at an investment bank, I was actually a second year, I was only supposed to be there for six months. And I just remember always being um, really um, quite deeply ashamed of it, of, of my background. Um, I was not an Oxford student. I was not um, a straight A student by any means. Um, I felt like I'd 
at the time at least felt like I failed one career. I just felt like, you know, I just felt like I was just inadequate um, for many of those conversations um, and and just didn't have the skill set or the, or the intellect. And, and I think that um, the real turning point for me certainly was, was one of my first managers in-house. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think it came out in conversation pretty early on in terms of what I'd been up to. And I was just, um, I just remember being terrified as I spoke, but I was just like, you know, new to this, new to this role, and this is like the beginning of the end. And, and actually, like, she was just so interested in it. Um, and aside from sort of my, the day-to-day of, like, what the job in active she made me appreciate that there were transferable skills um, and things that I could bring to the table that some other folks may not be able to, um, and perspectives that I, I would have as someone that, for instance, hadn't, uh, you know, uh, had an Oxbridge uh, degree, hadn't had three years of uh, an undergraduate degree in law, you know, and hadn't had a training contract at a magic circle firm um, or, you know, a US Whitey firm, um, trained at a smaller organisation. That ability to connect with people in different ways than, you know, um, uh, what I perceived as the must-haves being effective within the House Council. And it's really interesting because I, I still continue to see that. You know, I'm very lucky um, in my in-house role at the moment in terms of managing people. I have, um, uh, when, I, when I'm very lucky, I'm, I'm able to call them to from law firms to come sit with me um, for six months from their, from their law firm. And you always get the question from, you know, hiring partners, managing partners, you know, what are you, what are you looking for? In terms of in terms of team members, you know, do you, is it is it the, the technicals or is it the soft stuff? Like, you know, what are you looking for? And always, you know, I, I, if, if I could have my cake and eat it, I would I would take both. And it's great if someone can recite all the pages of Fisma or Method Two. That's that's very impressive. But that's certainly not a must-have for me. Um, and you know, it's the academics. Yes, are good. Um, and and sometimes a necessary evil, um, in terms of you know um, um, sifting through applications, but it's certainly not the sort of the magic stuff, the magic ingredient that I think makes a really really um, effective in house council. It's it, it's the ability to communicate, to work in a team, to be open to other ideas, to work to find solutions. That's all, that's that really separates people. Uh, in terms of what, in terms of what we do, I think. Um, so, again, um, I I really welcome certainly at TV and certainly in terms of other, you know, my peers and folks that I talk to in the industry. I really welcome opening as many doors as possible, so that people from, um, you know, uh, diverse backgrounds, um, whether it's social, economical. Um, Geographic, you know, can can, can really um, come come and in, in, um, into these institutions and bring their perspective. Um, and and again, it's like once it's not it's not we need to dispel this 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 perception. Let's do that is an additional squeeze on resource or an additional squeeze on budget or somehow not commercial. Like it's the it, it, it's the most commercial thing we can do because. Um, we look at our stakeholders within the bank, we look at our customers, we look at our role as a bank and as an independent, as a broker dealer in society. Uh, it, it is to bring everyone with us. Like, it's just good business sense. So, you know, um, I've always, I've, I, I like, again, really coming around the house is that that initial example in terms of that person that really took a punt on me. I think, and again, I need to stop talking myself down in terms of taking a punt. Um, uh, I really try and take that forward in terms of the people that I choose to work with and the way that I like to, to be an inclusive leader. I don't want anyone to think that, you know, their background or how they think, you know, again, um, is, a, is a drawback or is somehow a deficit to how they work. I think it's all about them, you know, it's all, it, it, that there is something in everything. So when you look a little bit further in terms of 
beyond your style, you know, what what do you think remains the biggest barrier to inclusion? Because obviously we're not there yet. I mean, you've thought through quite a lot of the aspects, but what what is the barrier that's kind of still in the way of us being more inclusive? I, th I think that, I think there's I think there's several. Um, again, I think it's about acknowledging there's so much work to be done. I feel like certainly from my privileged position. I, I still sometimes feel like so many others in my position aren't, it's not as much on the agenda as it should be. Um, I think that that is going to, frankly, continue to be a challenge in the next couple of years, certainly in terms of markets and, and um, you know, in terms of um, policy, you know, we're, we're certainly going to see some tough times economically in the next couple of years, and I think there's a real there's a real danger, um, you know, uh, of of this somehow uh, of inclusive inclusive leadership and inclusivity not necessarily falling off the agenda, but but other priorities starting to creep up. And again, I think it's about people that try and separate these these priorities and where things start to go wrong in the first place. Um, I think it's about um, not just similar to a lot of the conversations around ESG, you know. Four or five years ago, in some respects, I'm really happy that I think for a lot of around a lot of the boards, a lot of the committees that I sit around now, you know, DE and I inclusivity is it's a known quantity. It's something that, that everyone knows that that folks you know in the majority know it's something that they have to tackle. But we still don't we aren't anywhere along the way of okay. So how do we tackle that? Um, and, and what are we going to do? How are we going to crystallise that all that good energy and intention? Because it's all well and good us having conversations saying, yeah, we should be inclusive. But like, what's that actually mean? Let's get some rigour around it. And you know, one thing we haven't talked about yet, which you know, uh, again, you have to be very clever these, these days not to mention AI in any conversation about anything because it's so ubiquitous. But like, I think that the one ace in our hands for getting rigor around inclusiveness and making sure that we you know set ourselves on the best possible path is using technology right in terms of um, um detaching ourselves from process you know um objectifying processes um you know removing um these sort of uh subconscious influences in terms of processes that we're not even aware of you know i think i think is great in terms of you know when a cv lands across your desk in terms of you know the ability to anonymize certain data or aggregate certain data but now on the flip side again it's really interesting you know who's teaching the computers um i think that it's really important that we remain when it comes to AI, when it remains everything, it's, it's a balance between remaining curious and open and, and taking the best of all this stuff that's out there, but also just having a healthy dose of cynicism about the things and being realistic and knowing that AI isn't the sort of silver bullet that's going to solve all of our problems and it's going to be iterative and there's going to be scrutiny that's involved with it to make sure that it's not left to its own devices and that we end up with a you know equally negative outcome. Um, so I think it's about utilising technology, uh, uh, a top-down and a bottom-up approach, um, and just keeping that central idea in mind for me, which permeates everything, which is that inclusivity is not counter to productivity or being commercial or to doing a good job or growing a business. It's central to it. So. So if that's what you're there to do, inclusivity is a, is a byword, should be a byword for you. Well, I totally agree with you. And this is why I decided to start these conversations, I think, partly to share some of the how. So it becomes something that hopefully helps other leaders who want more, but they, you know, some examples of good um, leadership can be helpful for them to kind of shift them a little bit. But also, as you said, to keep it front of mind because we are at the crossroads um, and it, it is very important for what future we're building. So you can't drop it, but 
it feels like it's a good time for those of us who want to keep the conversations and put our heads up to say, actually, you can't dilute the importance of this subject. We need to keep it front of mind. So I agree with you. That's, um, you know, so I'm grateful that you were able to join. So I wanted to ask you, going back again to leadership and how we reflect on ourselves, what do you think is the one question? And also going back to the how, right? So what is the one question um, you should ask yourself if you want to be more inclusive? Before I say anything, like just, just shutting up a bit <laughs> and, and asking the question in my mind, but, but, um, but just not needing to rush that process. Um, and, and really thinking rather than what, what do I need out of this conversation? What do I need to achieve? Really using that partnership model, that collaborative model to really see the person that's sitting across from me and be like, what does this person need? What is this person trying to achieve? And it's okay if that person is trying to achieve something which is a fundamental opposition to what I'm trying to achieve. Sometimes knowing what you're up against is like nine tenths of the battle. But that sort of narrow mindedness of um, I've got a set view and my view must be the right view because it's the only view I can think of and this other person doesn't share my views so they must be somehow worse at their job or not know what they're talking about. Um, I mean, you know, the question of you know, what can I do for someone else um, I think is super important to, to making people feel recognized and included and and also again one really nice silver lining to that for me which i you know it's a relatively recent revelation is that um as i i like to help people i'm definitely a people pleaser in terms of i like people to feel good about themselves and as a byproduct i like if people like me because i help them feel good about themselves and I feel that by turning the conversation outwards and including people and bringing them in as a byproduct is awesome that it makes me feel really empowered um, and like I'm doing something worthwhile and I think that in today's society there's so much going on and with mental health crises left right and centre the ability to have something to centre me in that way, I find really helpful for my day to day. So again, it's all it's all fortuitous. So yeah, it's less about what can you do for me, and and more how can I how can I help you? And again, it's that revelation about leading. You know, I I, I think at the start of my career, I was always really sort of I always saw leaders as these sort of demigods, these sort of superhumans that like knew it all, saw it all. And actually, more and more now, I'm realising that the best leaders just surround themselves with the best people and just champion those people. And the rest is actually really easy. It's, it's just they, they let people do their thing. I love the focus on the others, to be honest. I think that's such a great um, way to take us to the last question. Who is your role model for inclusive leadership and why? I might go for a really left field one. I'm going to say, actually, my son. Um, I'm going to pick my son, um, Joshua, who um, is six years old, and um, I've had, uh, as a family, we've had a lot of challenges um, um, over the last couple of years, um, uh, mainly um, through sort of um, a lot of behavioural challenges we've had with, with Joshua. Um, so Joshua um, is... Um, has been clinically diagnosed with um, ADHD and, and, and autism, um, and it's uh, it's it's really um, made me in the last couple of years really have to uh, communicate, negotiate with someone who just sees the world very differently to to me, um, and just does not communicate in the same language that I do. Um, but um, you know, my the saving grace. Uh, with the, of the many saving graces with my son is that um, he's just such a warm, um, um, creative, um, inclusive person. 
And he's never, you know, if you were to ask him, like, does he feel different in terms of, like, his perspective and how he communicates about things? It wouldn't ever cross his mind. And he's always the first person to explain to someone how, you know, why are clouds up in the sky the way they are? And it's nothing to do with the condensation. It's more to do with, you know, well, pillows have to come from somewhere, you know. And it's just, it, 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 it keeps me... Um, it, I, I thought every conversation for, that I've had with Joshua, like I come out revitalized at the end of it. And it just makes me, you know, feel um, amazing that he never sees his challenges as setbacks. He always sees them as that ace up his sleeve, that super, superpower. And I really hope uh, that he continues to see that um, in his adulthood. So, Again, I think I am inspired by people around me um, that are the polar opposite of me in terms of how they think and how they approach things. Um, because I think if you're not open to that, then yes, you're treading water, you're stagnating, you're potentially even going backwards. Uh, to your point, you know, we were starting to talk about the, at the start of the conversation, you know, it's about putting yourself in uncomfortable positions um, in, 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 in in uncomfortable discussions um and you know if, if someone disagrees with you it doesn't mean that they're a bad person or that you're a bad person and conversation and discussion and maybe meeting in the middle maybe not meeting in the middle that's that's so important um and you need that above all else in the workplace because that's how we continue to grow um and continue doing right by by you know our, our clients and the people that we work with that was just a wonderful role model example, really. Um, I love what our children teach us every day. Um, so thank you, Sam, for joining me today and for sharing your insights and thoughts and the how-to to being a more inclusive leader. And to our viewers, I hope you found this conversation interesting and useful, and it's given you plenty of ideas for making your workplace, your team and organization more inclusive. To find more conversations on inclusivity, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, Obelisk Support, or connect with me on LinkedIn, searching Dana Dennis-Smith and heading to my video section. If you have any questions or feedback, I'd love to hear from you. You can get in touch by email at d.dennis-smith at obeliskupport.com. Thank you for listening and for watching and uh, joining Take the Stand, Inclusive Leaders. See you next time.